So good morning, everyone, and it's uh, it's a pleasure to share uh, with you some thoughts about uh, where Cochlear is going from a research and development and from a product innovation perspective. Uh, so as Dick uh, mentioned this morning, our mission uh, is, has remained uh, the same as we've gone through a number of, uh, of changes in the organization because we believe it's fundamentally a very strong mission and a mission that compels to many of our, uh, of our co-workers. And in this section, of course, we're going to talk about the bottom part of the mission, which is the innovation part, eh? because it's been so important uh, element of Cochlear's success in the past, and we strongly believe it will also continue to be an important element of our future success. And it's not only because it's important for us as a market leader to have technology leadership from a competitive perspective, it is also because we truly believe that product innovation can play a role in helping grow the market. And I'll try to explain that a bit uh, in, the, in the following slides. As we've heard from Dick, uh, there's millions of people that could benefit from a cochlear implant who have not been implanted uh, to date, in uh, particular in that adult segment, about 3% penetration uh, to date. And uh, when we ask ourselves the question, why is that? Why is it that, that so few people get, get implanted? Um, then we've come to the insight that there's a number of factors that play a role, uh, particularly for adults. And we know that on average, it can take 10 years for someone to uh, meet cochlear implant criteria to then effectively be implanted with a cochlear, with a cochlear implant. And that's because getting to that treatment is a bit like an obstacle race. Uh, there's many different hurdles that uh, potential candidates have to overcome. There's the lack of awareness. Yeah. There's the access that's not always there. The concern about surgery, potential loss of residual hearing, and I'll talk a bit more about that through the rest of the presentation. The outcomes are not always predictable. Usually they're very good, but not, not always. Uh, the size and aesthetics of the device, and then last but not least, also the, the complexity of the intervention, in particular what happens after surgery. And that's why we make such significant investments in what we call connected care, for example, to really simplify what happens uh, after surgery. So as we endeavor to make cochlear implantation uh, the standard of care for those people who could benefit from it, yeah, we need to stepwise, step by step, try to either eliminate these hurdles or remove these hurdles altogether. And so a lot of what we do uh, in product innovation is aimed at eliminating or lowering these hurdles on this, on this slide. And today we want to also specifically talk a little bit about the lack of awareness with professionals. And to do that, um, we uh, I would like to share with you a, um, a piece of research out of Germany. This comes out of uh, the university ENT department out of the University of Erlangen in Germany, a significant uh, ENT uh, facility. And they recently did a study where they looked at the outcomes that people achieve with their hearing aids. It was over 300 ears fitted with a hearing aid that are plotted on this, on this graph here. At the bottom, the horizontal axis, you see the level of hearing loss. Yeah, from no hearing loss yeah. all the way to 120 dB of hearing loss, which means 120 dB means you really hear nothing. Yeah? Even a, a fighter jet next to your bed wouldn't, uh, wouldn't wake you up. And then on the other axis, you see the speech recognition score. Yeah? So that's a measure in how well, how well people can understand speech. It's based on a simple word test. You listen to 20 words, and you just count how many words are correct. Yeah? And as you would expect, the worse the hearing loss gets, yeah, the lower the score is for people. That's in itself not, not unusual. Now, what did surprise us when we, when we uh, uh, saw this study uh, is the number of people actually not doing well at all yeah, with their conventional hearing aid. And in fact, if you draw the line at 30% speech recognition score, yeah, which is what in Germany is a bit the rule of thumb to refer someone from, from a cochlear implant. Actually, from a reimbursement perspective, it's even 50% in, in Japan, in the US, and in Germany. So this is actually a fairly conservative way to represent it. So if, you, if one of your ears yeah, follows below the, that, that blue line, yeah, it actually means yeah, that uh, the outcome that you get with that ear from a functional perspective is all not that great. Yeah? If you only get three out of 10 words correct, yeah, you can imagine that it's pretty hard to follow a conversation. Yeah? Now, traditionally, Cochlear implants have been used in this segment, what we call profound hearing loss. So those are people that have hearing loss over 90 decibel. And if you look in that segment, of course, you could see that most of the dots here fall below that blue line. In other words, these are clearly people that could potentially benefit from a cochlear implant and often are referred for a cochlear implant. 
The other segment, however, is a segment next to which, which we call the severe to profound uh, segment of hearing loss. And what surprised us is also in that segment, yeah, actually half, more than half, yeah, of the uh, ears in this segment fitted with a hearing aid yeah, do not better than 30% on the speech recognition test. And therefore, yeah, ought to be referred for a cochlear implant according to uh, the practices in Germany in this case. And, and many countries uh, are similar, but like Dick mentioned, uh, indications can differ a bit from country to country. But in terms of outcomes, it's the same. If you don't score more than three out of 10 words correct in, in a test like this, you're gonna struggle to really function uh, as, a, as a hearing person. Now it even gets more interesting because then the same group uh, proceeded to refer uh, patients that uh, met that criteria for a cochlear implant. And a subgroup of those did get, did get implanted, about 38 uh, uh, did get implanted. And before their implantation, the median score of this group was around 10%. Yeah. That was, like I mentioned, up to 30, but the median score in that group was uh, 10%. When that group then received their cochlear implant, and uh, the team there made, remeasured their outcomes with a cochlear implant, their word score jumped to 75% speech recognition score. In other words, they gained 65 percentage points when they moved from a typically high power hearing aid to a cochlear implant. Yeah. And I think that underlines the potential that, uh, that Dick spoke about and that we see particularly in that adult seniors uh, segment. The other thing that it's, what it does for us from a product innovation perspective is that we, excuse me, is that we also need to think about the needs in that segment because that may be a little bit different from people who are in that segment versus the profoundly uh, impaired hearing uh, loss group. For example, with respect to preservation of residual hearing. Yeah. If you're all the way here, it probably doesn't matter so much you lose your residual hearing, but in that group, the level of residual hearing that you may have can be very valuable to you because it could be that with a known person you can still communicate in a quiet environment, you can still hear the dog bark and things like that. So that preservation is becoming an increasingly important element uh, of, uh, of cochlear implant technology in an area where we are significantly uh, invested in the past and continue to invest going forward. So that gives you a bit of a perspective on the, uh, the, the hurdles that we need to overcome, but also the potential that we have to apply cochlear implants much more broadly than they are applied uh, today. Now, Dick already mentioned uh, about our cochlear implant, about our, excuse me, about our product innovation commitment. Uh, last year, 150 million that we invested in research and development and medical affairs. It's actually both, both elements that, uh, that we report on in that number. And of course, that's uh, very important uh, to have, make sure we have the right clinical evidence, we get the right uh, regulatory approvals, et cetera, that are part, of, of course, of the, of the product innovation process. Over the years, we've built up a global innovation capability. You're here at our, at our global headquarters where about two thirds of the R&D activities take place. About one third takes place uh, overseas. Uh, but what's also very important for us is the collaborative uh, research network that we've set up. Uh, many of our customers, of our academic uh, cochlear implant centers are interested in research and there's also a lot of other centers uh, that work, for example, in the area of biology research and hearing loss that we, that we partner with, as well as external design partners and suppliers uh, that we work with. We have the partnership with Resound. Uh, we work closely together with Apple, for example, for Nucleus 7, uh, etc. In terms of the scope of the R&D activities, it starts all the way from really monitoring what's happening in relevant research areas, both from a basic research perspective, what's happening in terms of understanding the causes of hearing loss, the genetics of hearing loss, for example, and also what's happening in fields of technology that may be relevant to our future products, for example, rechargeable batteries and things like that. Uh, those are mostly monitoring activities. When they come to a point that we believe they become relevant for cochlear, we will start to take them into applied research projects or into internal technology developments to prepare know-how, algorithms, building blocks for what then goes into the actual product development. And so the majority of the investment in research and development is the actual product development where we take these new insights and new building blocks and new algorithms into new products. Along the way, significant and increasing investment in making sure we have the right clinical evidence, and David will, will more uh, speak about the importance uh, of that, uh, so that we convince ourselves, we convince our customers, we convince regulators that the product is meeting all the requirements by the time we eventually then bring it to market. 
We do have a very uh, solid and stringent product development process that we follow, uh, depicted uh, here, uh, again to make sure that the product does meet the actual customer needs uh, and that we also proven to ourselves uh, that by the time we release the product that uh, it is meeting those customer needs and that we convince regulators that the product is safe and effective uh, for uh, potential uh, users of it. An increasing area also in the entire R&D investment is what's called post-market post studies. So those are studies that are done after a product is released on the market. For example, we have a significant study running at the moment on our slimmer dialer electrode. I'll mention to that later. But also to continue to build evidence about the effectiveness of cochlear implants, we more and more start to do these post-market studies. And next to that, also regulators expect from us increasingly, there's new, particularly in Europe, there's new regulation coming in, to demonstrate that the product remains fit for purpose as time progresses. So Dick already alluded a bit to what the main areas of focus are that we have in product innovation. First of all, we want to continue to drive and improve hearing outcomes and consistency of hearing outcomes. Secondly, we want to make sure that the devices fit really well with people's day-to-day -day lives. Thirdly, we want to make sure that we can simplify the whole clinical pathway, in particular what happens after the surgery. And finally, we want to make sure that we have the right uh, or the appropriate uh, portfolio of implantable hearing solutions for a wide range of indications that could benefit from an implanted solution. And so I'll give you a few uh, high-level insights on each of those, and then Derek and Keith will go more in detail on some specific elements uh, on that picture. In terms of hearing outcomes, there it's all about making sure that we look at hearing outcomes in a quite broad sense. It's not only about speech recognition, it's also about sound quality, music perception, localization. These are all elements where today there's still quite a significant gap between someone who receives a cochlear implant and a normal hearing person. So our objective is to, over the years, step by step, reduce the gap between implanted recipients and normal hearing people. One of the key elements to do that yeah, is the electrode technology. So the electrode is the part of the cochlear implant that delivers the electrical stimulation to the hearing nerve. Yeah, so that's the part that goes inside the cochlea or the inner ear. And about two years ago we uh, released, or 18 months ago we released what's called the nucleus slimmer dialer electrode, which is a brand new electrode. It's a so-called paramodialer electrode that sits very close to the hearing nerve. But at the same time, it's very atraumatic. And we've been very satisfied with the market's uh, response uh, to this device. Uh, a benchmark study with over 100 patients is underway and we'll report uh, to you about that, of course, uh, when that's available. But also very encouraging is we get uh, very, uh, still anecdotal, but very encouraging reports about the ability also of this device to preserve residual hearing. And I mentioned earlier why that it's a, an, an important factor. Preservation is often uh, very feasible with what we call straight or lateral wall electrodes, but with pyramidal electrodes it's a bit harder, but it was an important objective of this device to make it very thin and atraumatic, and we're very pleased with the anecdotal feedback that we have uh, on that element uh, of this device. Another element uh, in terms of hearing outcomes that's important is the ability for people to hear with two ears. Now we know that particularly in that adult segment, typically there's only reimbursement for one ear which means that often people will use a hearing aid in the other ear. And hence the importance of the partnership that we have with GN Hearing, with uh, Resound. And we made sure that with the Nucleus 7 technology that we released last year, that we also provide recipients with the ability to stream a phone call, to stream music, the navigation uh, guidance from their, uh, uh, from their app to both ears, uh, whether that's two cochlear implants or whether that's a cochlear implant and a resound hearing aid. And uh, Keith will talk more about Nucleus 7 and how that streaming works. But again, that hearing with two ears is so important. And then the other element in the, uh, in the hearing outcomes perspective is then really understanding why sometimes people lose residual hearing after cochlear implantation and what can we do about it. And there's a lot of activities, and I'm sure many of you have seen reports about scientists working on alternative biological or pharma approaches to treat hearing loss. Yeah. Uh, our perspective is that uh, none of those have the potential on the short or medium term to really uh, become a substitute for cochlear implants. But what we do believe is that a combination of a device and a drug has true potential to enhance outcomes and to enhance the preservation of residual hearing. And uh, we have a number of partnerships in this, uh, in this space, often with academic centers, 
but uh, just before Christmas, we entered into a, uh, uh, we made a small investment in a French company called Sensorion uh, to work together with that, with that uh, company on a combination therapy uh, to provide a high level of preservation of residual hearing following cochlear implantation. Quickly, uh, just quickly touch on the other uh, three areas in terms of lifestyle. Uh, we of course want to make sure that our devices become small, light, easy to use. And with N7, I think we've delivered a fantastic product, uh, delivering on that promise. We also then uh, moved not only towards uh, behind the ear processes, but also of the ear processes with Canso. And that also for the future, we believe is an important uh, offering uh, to maintain. And of course, we also continue to work on so-called totally implantable solutions, which can be used even without the use of an external sound processor. So as Dick said, because of the scale we have, we can progress at multiple fronts at the same time. And from a lifestyle perspective, we believe that these three wearing options, if you want, uh, are important for a future success. In terms of connected care, uh, Derek will really give you the deep dive. Uh, but what's really helping is that there's many technologies that we are familiar with in day-to-day -day life. Wireless technology, connected uh, cloud technology, artificial intelligence is starting to become part of our day-to-day -day life. Uh, virtual reality, perhaps not so much yet. But what we are seeing is that a lot of these technologies are moving into healthcare. And so we're also then embarking uh, on that journey and looking in how we can use some of these technologies in our space. Last year, we uh, again went into a, into a license agreement uh, with a small uh, startup uh, out of Belgium using uh, artificial intelligence, for example, for the fitting of cochlear implant recipients. And we have a pilot program underway uh, to, uh, to further test that, that technology. And then lastly, we want to make sure that we have an appropriate portfolio to be able to treat a broad range of indications of hearing loss, uh, those indications where a traditional air conduction hearing aid is not sufficient. We want to make sure that we have the appropriate solution. Uh, today we talk a lot about cochlear implants, but also we keep a lot of innovation going on in bone conduction. And in fact, we have a study underway at the moment with the next generation uh, bone conduction device where the vibrating element is in, is in fact implanted uh, in the head. So again, in summary, these are the four areas that we focus our product innovation activities on. And to finish, just an overview slide to illustrate how Cochlear over the last 35 years has step-by-step -step improved this intervention and has in that way also made it available to a broader range of potential candidates by improving outcomes, by improving the ability for people to use technology also in the real world, which is noisy, uh, to make sure that it fits with their lifestyle, have electrodes that, are, uh, that help to preserve residual hearing, have implants that are extremely reliable nowadays, and then with Nucleus 7, I think we've put a little bit of cherry on the cake for the time being, uh, and delivered really a new benchmark in terms of sound processor outcomes and, uh, and experience. And with that, I'll introduce uh, Keith Walsh. Uh, Keith is heading uh, our um, sound processor development, and we'll uh, go a bit more in detail on that part of the product innovation. Thank you.